Hey everyone, welcome back. We are jumping up to chapter 21 on nuclear chemistry. So there's six sections here. We have nuclear structure and stability, nuclear equations, radioactive decay, transmutation and nuclear energy, uses of radioisotopes, and biological effects of radiation. So just our starting image, um, the nuclear chemistry is used for a lot of different things. Um, for example, um, in the medical field, uh, PET scans, positron emission tomography, um, is used for looking uh, at the human body um, to look for different um, things. Um, a lot of times it is used for things like cancer um, scans. So starting off with 21.1, 21, uh, 21 nuclear structure and stability. In this section we're going to describe nuclear structure in terms of protons, neutrons, and electrons, calculate mass defect and binding energy for nuclei, and explain trends in the relative stability of nuclei. So nuclear chemistry is the study of reactions that involve changes in nuclear structure. So just to kind of review some things from way in the beginning of 2A, we have atomic number, okay, and here we're abbreviating it with a Z, and this represents the number of protons. Mass number, which is abbreviated with an A, which I know it feels kind of backwards because atomic number starts with an A, but nonetheless, mass number is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons. And isotopes are atoms that have the same atomic number but different mass numbers. So they differ in the number of neutrons in the nucleus. And if it's the same, if they're isotopes, that means the, they're the same atoms, so they have the same number of protons. So it's that number of neutrons that's going to be different. Now a couple new terms. When we have a single type of nucleus, we call this a nuclide. And we use this um, atom notation, which we used before at the beginning of Chem 2A, um, where A is the mass number, Z is the atomic number, and that X there represents your um, chemical element symbol. Another new term, protons and neutrons together are called nucleons. So, nucle so these are the nucleons, they're tightly packed in the nucleus. Um, and then, if you recall, the nucleus is very, 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 very small relative to the entire atom, but it is very, very dense. Um, for example, uh, a nuclei have an average density of 1.8 times 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, so they may be really tiny, but they're very, very dense. I mean, for comparison, the density of water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So I used to get this question a lot um, from Chem 2A students asking me, well, how come the, um, the protons are able to be in the nucleus and not repel each other? Um, and that's because we have a very strong attractive force that holds the nucleus together. It is called the strong nuclear force. It is one of four fundamental forces. Um, this is just a little extra tidbit for you. Um, there's the electromagnetic force, gravitational force, and nuclear weak forces that are the other three fundamental forces. So we're going to go ahead and start and look at an example for calculate the density of a neutron star. So we're told neutron stars form when the core of a very massive star undergoes gravitational collapse, causing the star's outer layers to explode in a supernova. Composed with almost entirely of neutrons, they are the densest known stars in the universe, with densities comparable to the average density of an atomic nucleus. A neutron star in a faraway galaxy has a mass equal to 2.4 solar masses. And we're told one solar mass equals m, whatever we want to call that thing which is equal to the mass of the sun, 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, and a diameter of 26 kilometers. So A wants the density of the neutron star, and B wants, this to, uh, wants us to compare this to the density of a uranium nucleus, and it gives us the um, 
diameter of a uranium nucleus. All right, so we're going to assume these are spheres, which we can kind of figure out based off of what we are told from our information. So, and then we also know that the density of something is equal to the mass divided by volume, and the volume of a sphere is equal to four-thirds pi r cubed, where r is the radius. So for A, the density of the neutron star, we need to get its radius first. And we're told it has a diameter of 26 kilometers. So the radius then is the diameter divided by two. So that's 26 kilometers divided by two. And then we also need to go ahead and do that we have 1,000 meters per one kilometer. Just so we can have um, some easier units here, we're going to go ahead and use meters. So then this is 1.3 times 10 to the fourth meters. And so now our density, since density is mass over volume, volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed, we can rewrite this to say that density is equal to mass divided by 4 thirds pi r cubed. So then the density of our neutron star is equal to the mass, which we're told 2.4 solar masses. So we can say we have 2.4 solar masses and we want to train this into kilograms and we're told that one solar mass is equal to 1.99 times 10 to the 30th. So we can even do this, put 2.4 and put SM for solar mass. I know it gave, or actually it gave us that symbol, whatever you want to call this symbol, times, we know there's 1.99 times 10 to the 30th kilograms every one solar mass. So that's the mass part divided by our volume, or yep, our volume, four thirds times pi times our radius cubed, 1.3 times 10 to the fourth meters cubed. So our units are gonna be kilograms per cubic meter. And this calculates to be 5.2 times 10 to the 17th kilograms per cubic meter. And one of the reasons we went ahead and used meters instead of leaving it as kilometers is for part B because we're going to compare it to a uranium nucleus, um, which it gives us in femtometers um, for its diameter and then tells us what it is in terms of meters. And it's so we can be able to actually compare the units. So for part B now, we need to go ahead and get the density of this uranium nucleus. It's going to be the same mass over 4 thirds pi r cubed. Um, and the mass of a uranium nucleus, when you just look up uranium, it has a mass of 235 AMU. But we need this to be in grams or, or kilograms and so when we look that up we see that there's 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms for every 1 AMU. We can see our AMU's cancel to give us kilograms there divided by 4 thirds pi times our radius And now when we're told this was our diameter is 15, so our radius has to is divided by two. So 15 femtometers, we can just go ahead and write this as saying 15 times 10 to the negative 15 divided by two. And that's cubed. And so this gets you 2.2 times 10 
to the 17th kilograms per cubic meter. So comparing them, we see they're on the same magnitude. Okay, uh, look at that density um, in terms of powers of 10. They're both 10 to the 17th power. Um, but the neutron star is overall denser. Twice as dense. There is a typo in the book. It tries to say that the nucleus is more de is twice as dense as the uh, neutron star, but it's the other way around. The neutron star is more dense than the nucleus, but still, um, that's pretty crazy to think that this tiny atom's nucleus is this dense and is on the same magnitude of density of a neutron star. So now we're going to talk about nuclear binding energy, and we're going to start by calculating the total mass of a helium atom that has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. So aka helium or two. So protons, I know we, we've always up to this point said a proton is one AMU, uh, electron is zero and neutron is one, but we're going to use their actual like their actual exact masses. So the protons here, there's two of them times 1.0073 AMU. The neutrons we have two times 1.0087 AMU, and then our electrons we, again we have two times 0 0.00055 AMU, and this comes out to be 4.0331 AMU. But if we were to put this compound into a mass spectrometer, which we can get the atomic mass of things from, we get a mass of 4.0026 AMU. These are not the same number. So we can take the difference, and this difference for the helium atom, okay, is called the mass defect. So you're going to have different mass defects for different atoms. So don't think that every atom has a mass defect of 0 0.0305. This is just for the helium atom. Um, and so what these mass defects are, or they're created when the um, mass in the nucleus of the, um, converts into energy as an atom forms. So this nuclear binding energy now is the energy that's produced when the atom's nucleons are binding together. So this is also how much energy you need to break a nucleus into its protons and neutrons. And it is way, 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 way larger than chemical bond energies. We can use that um, mass defect and convert it into energy using the mass energy equivalence equation made famous by Einstein, AKA E equals MC squared. So we are actually going to be using E equals MC squared. It really does come into play. So E represents our energy, M is the mass of our matter being converted, and C is the speed of light in a vacuum. So um, a new unit also that we have for energy is the electron volt. Um, and one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. Um, your energy, you calculate it in terms of joules, but then you can go ahead and switch it over to these electron volts if you need to. Um, something you should also know is when you have a chemical reaction, so not a nuclear reaction, a chemical reaction, you know, we don't really see a change of mass. Maybe on the nanogram range, so that 10 to the negative 9 grams, um, but that's really not something that we can see in a lab. Um, and when we're talking about the bond enthalpies, we're talking kilojoules per mole in the thousands. Um, but when we compare this energy change from breaking and forming bonds compared to breaking and forming nuclei, that energy change is tiny. Um, whereas nuclear binding energies are, so, are big enough where we can actually see them in the lab because they can cause differences on the milligram scale. So that's the 10 to the negative third range. Um, and our energies here are, we're talking billions of kilojoules per mole. So no longer thousands, we're talking about billions. So very, very, very high energy um, due to breaking and forming these nuclei.
So let's go ahead and look at an example to calculate uh, some nuclear binding energy. We want to figure out the binding energy for the nuclide uh, 4 2 helium. Um, we're given its mass defect, and we want to look at this um, binding energy in joules per mole of nuclei, joules per nucleus, and um, mega electron volts per nucleus. So this is a good example of something maybe I'd give you on an exam. I give you the mass defect, you'd so, um, or I might say, okay, here's the atom, here's what the detected mass is. So then you have to go and calculate what the um, calculated mass is based off the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and then you can calculate the mass defect. Okay. Let's see, so where are we? So one of the first things we need to do is um, take our mass defect in AMUs and change it to grams per mole. And we know that those are basically the same thing, molar mass and AMU. So we can go ahead then and say that this is 0 0.0305 grams per mole for our mass defect. And then because joules use kilograms, not grams, we need to change this over to kilograms. So we have one kilogram for every 1,000 grams. And I'm just doing this just so we have this um, conversion ahead of time. So now we have 3.05 times 10 to the negative 5 kilograms per one mole. Okay. So for part A, joules per mole of nuclei, and we're looking at nuclear binding energy, so that means we need E equals mc squared. And we have our mass of 3.05 times 10 to the negative 15 kilograms per one mole. And see, notice that it says it, we want joules per mole of nuclei. So it's fine that in terms of mass, we're saying kilograms per mole, because this is still, that is still a term for mass. And we're multiplying this times the speed of light, c squared. So we have 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and that is squared. And so this then is 2.74 times 10 to the 12th uh, joules per mole. Kilogram meter squared per second squared um, is a joule. So this is joules per mole. Um, if you wanted for different units, we could make this into terajoules. And there's one terajoule per 10 to the 12th joules. So tera is 10 to the 12th. So this is 2.74 terajoules per mole. Either answer is perfectly fine. I don't care. It want it told us joules per mole, so I don't even know why we're bothering putting it in terajoules. Okay. Now B wanted joules per nucleus. So what we need to do is use our good old friend Avogadro's number. Because now we have joules per mole, and instead we want joules per nuclei, so we want to count. So if you remember, we have that one mole of anything is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. In this case, nuclei. So we're going to go ahead and take our 2.74 times 10 to the 12th joules per one mole, and then we have one mole for every 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd nuclei. So this is 4.55 times 10 to the negative 12th joules, um, or you could also say um, 4.55 picojoules. OK, 
Okay. I always thought Picos are really cute. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Thing. I'm tired. Okay. So then C wanted um, mega electron volts. So now remember we talked about electron volts. There's one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. So we can go ahead and use part B for this because this is this electron volt is equal to this many joules, not joules per mole. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and use this 4.55 times 10 to the negative 12th joules times one electron volt per 1.602 times 10 to the 19th joules. And this gives us 2.84 times 10 to the 7th electron volts. Um, and then that is equal to 28.4 mega electron volts. I will leave that to you guys to look up if you need to for that conversion. Because I know you guys can do basic unit conversions by now. Okay, so now let's move on talking about nuclear stability. So if you have um, a nucleus, it's stable if it cannot be transformed into another configuration without adding energy from the outside. Um, and, oh, that should be stable, not stabe. Um, of the thousands of nuclei, nuclides that exist, there's only about 250 that are stable. Um, we can make a plot, which we'll see on the next slide or two slides from here. Um, where we look at the number of neutrons versus the number of protons. Um, and there, it ends up causing, making this very narrow kind of band um, that is called the band of stability. And when you look at it, um, you notice that the lighter, the lighter molecular weight um, stable nuclei have equal numbers of protons and neutrons, and then they land on the one-to-one -one neutron to proton line. So if we're looking at the one-to-one -one line, so that means that there's the same number of neutrons as protons. The more the lighter um, nuclei are um, ha on that one-to-one -one line, so they have the same number of neutrons and protons. However, when you have larger, heavier stable nuclei, they have more neutrons than protons. So they are now above that one-to-one -one neutron to proton line. And this is because they have more proton-proton repulsions due to the higher number in the nucleus. So you need more neutrons to add more strong forces to overcome these repulsions and then hold the nucleus together. And then when you have nuclei that are to the left or the right of the band, these are unstable and have radioactivity. So when we look at the plot, you'll notice there's kind of like another color around it. So these are the radioactive atoms. Um, these ones can spontaneously decay into other nuclei that are either in the band of stability or closer to it. Um, so basically they're converting an unstable radioisotope into another more stable isotope. So now we have a new type of isotope, radioisotopes, and that just means, you know, they're same pro number of protons, but one of them is radioactive. Or both, but, you know, different mass numbers. So this is that plot I was telling you about. Um, the blue kind of, the blue line here, it represents, is the, that band of the not, the st stable band. Um, those are the non-radioactive stable atoms. The green around it is where we have the radioactivity. And then this black line here is the one-to-one -one line. So you can see those lighter elements that are on the one-to-one -one line that have the same number of neutrons and protons. It's also kind of interesting to note that um, when you are greater than 83 um, protons, so greater than 83 atomic number, everything is unstable. Yeah. 
Now there actually are some trends and observations that can be made um, relating the stability of a nucleus to its structure. When you have a nuclei with even numbers of protons, neutrons, or both, they are more likely to be stable. So even numbers. Um, and then we also have magic numbers. So if you have a nuclei that has certain numbers of nucleons, um, these are going to be stable against nuclear decay. Um, and the magic numbers are 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, 126. Kind of sounds like a football call. Pike. <laughs> okay, so the, what, the reason these are magic numbers is they make complete shells in the nucleus. These are kind of similar to electron shells, um, but different. We're not going to really get into it, but this is why. Um, now, you can also have a nuclei that has both the protons and the neutrons with magic numbers, and these are called double magic. I know, super creative. Um, and these are super extra stable. So we can also calculate the relative stability um, by looking at it correlated with the binding energy per nucleon. So the, to the total binding energy for the nucleus, then you divide it by the number of nucleons in the nucleus. Um, so for example, looking back from that helium nucleus we looked at, um, the 4,2 helium, and we saw that its binding energy was 28.4 mega electron volts. So the binding energy per nucleon then would be 28.4 mega electron volts per four nucleons. And that gives us 7.10 mega electron volts per nucleon. So remember the nucleons, nucleons is the, the protons and neutrons. So basically it's mass number. And then there's a table here kind of give, giving you um, some of the magic numbers, um, some stable uh, nuclear isotopes giving you the number, of, uh, gives you the number of stable isotopes. So like for instance, there's 157 stable isotopes that have both even numbers of protons and neutrons down to five that have both odd numbers of protons and neutrons, whereas everything else, the re rest of the isotopes have at least one even number. And then this plot here shows you um, some binding energies per nucleon. Um, and so on the y-axis and the x-axis is your mass number. And you can see it's actually largest when you have a mass number around 56. So right about uh, here-ish. It's right where um, we have, it starts to go down. So our, that binding energy per nucleon actually starts to decrease over time or over mass number. Okay, so we have one more example for this section. We want to calculate the binding energy per nucleon for this iron nuclide. 5626 iron li lies near the top of the binding energy curve and is one of the most stable nucleides, nuclides when we want to know the binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts uh, for this nuclide and we're given its atomic mass. So we first need to figure out the mass defect. Um, and to do that, we need to get um, the calculated mass to start for this. So 5626, so we know that there are 26 protons, which means there has to be 30 neutrons to give us that mass number, and then 26 electrons. So then the mass then we have Oops. 26 protons times 1.0073 AMU plus 30 neutrons times 1.0087 AMU plus 26 electrons times 0 0.00055 AMU. So that gives us 56.4651 AMU and our mass defect then is 
56.4651 minus this given atomic mass of 55.9349 and we get 0 0.5302 AMU for our mass defect. So that's our first step. Um, our next step, which we can go ahead and put this as grams per mole. So our next step is to use um, E equals MC squared to get the binding energy for one nucleus. So we have E equals MC squared. And so we have 0 0.5302. Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. We don't want, we don't need to put this in grams per mole. Um, we're going to take this AMU and, ca and change it to just kilograms. Apologies, I got ahead of myself. 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms per 1 AMU. There's our mass times C, 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared. And so this is 7.913 times 10 to the negative 11th kilogram meters per second squared, which is a joule. And then we need to convert this to mega electron volts. And I'm just going to kind of help you out here and tell you there's one mega electron volt. We have the regular electron volts to joules, but we can go ahead and change it to mega per 1.602 times 10 to the negative 13th joules. And so that gives us 493.9 mega electron volts. And now we need, but we want it per nucleon. So now we have to do 493.9 mega electron volts divided by, we have 56 nucleons. And so that gives us 8.820 mega electron volts per nucleon. A bit larger than the uh, helium binding energy. So this would be a good um, type of exam question uh, that you might get because it's got kind of got multiple parts but as long as you pay attention to the examples you should be able to get it.